Did you see the man at the wedding? Everybody's talking of Telling everyone that he's got son And proving it with love Did you see the man at the wedding? Doing things that nobody can Everybody's calling him something different I just say he's a miracle man The man at the temple with the scribes and the Pharisees there saying that the God that we all fear it's his dad and he really cares and the crippled man by the poolside they tell me that he got up and ran nobody's sure where he found his cure all he'll say was a miracle man there are those not sure what he's about some take him in, some cast him out, but in my heart, can you see a doubt you'll see? Though he didn't change the stones to bread, he changed my heart of stone instead, with the way he lived and died and bled. A miracle man, a miracle man. People see me worship you, and they say I've gone too far. But they can only see the things you do I know who you are Did you see the man at the wedding? Turning water into wine Each and every day with him gets better One day you will find He'll be the one who's serving The marriage supper of the Lamb And you and I will live forever Bringing praise to our miracle man Bringing praise to our miracle So let's pray again. This has been a high Sabbath, Lord. A wonderful time we've had thinking about you, hearing about you, singing about you, listening to others sing about you, uh, swapping stories over the table at lunch, supper. It's just been a great day. Makes me think about what you have in store when we get to the other side. Just now we're wanting to look at you yet once more and yet once more we're asking that the Holy Spirit would stir our hearts. We pray that you'd give us spiritual eyes and spiritual ears and that you would rebuke the enemy's power to distract. For Jesus' sake, amen. So this will be the last time I'll be reading from this little book. And um, after the meeting and after Sabbath, Margie will be over at the table like she's been for a few nights, and she'll have the book and Buddy's CDs as well. But um, one last time from the book, um, the word became verse. I'm reading from chapter two. <clears throat> In the tiny town of Cana, which is part of Galilee, a wedding party ate and drank in festive jubilee. Christ's mother worked the kitchen in her task to oversee the direction of the servants as she helped wholeheartedly. Christ had been invited too, along with all his men, and many at the wedding feast were whispering of them. It seems the Baptist had proclaimed he was God's only son, and all were wondering what that meant. Had the Messiah come? 
Provisions started running low, and so Christ's mother said, my son, the wine's completely gone, although we still have bread. Jesus' answer puzzled her. My time has not yet come. What does she mean? What does he mean? She asked herself, yet trusted in her son. And so while pondering his response, she called some servants who were standing near and said to them, whatever he says, do. Six granite jars were close at hand, each large enough, we're told, that everyone, when filled to brim, could 30 gallons hold. Please fill those jars, the Savior said, with water, cool and pure. Then dip a cup and take it to that man just over there, who is the master of the feast. And once he's sampled some, you'll find there's wine enough to serve each wedding guest who's come. The master of the feast could not believe what he'd been given. This wine, he said, it tastes so good, it must have come from heaven. Each wedding guest agreed with him and asked the servants how it happened that they'd saved the best and only served it now. Miraculous, the servants said. And when they'd shared their story, it seemed to each and every one that they had seen Christ's glory. The Lord's disciples who were there believed from that day on. And possibly, his mother mused, perhaps his time has come. Before looking at this beginning of miracles that Jesus did, first, a few observations about Jesus. A few days earlier, He had refused to make bread for himself in the wilderness. But here he will make wine, a luxury contrasted with bread's necessity. Jesus wouldn't help himself even to a crust of bread. But he's ready to give not just necessities, but actually luxuries and joy to others. Selflessness, kindness, thoughtfulness. I think it's also worth noting that this is referred to as the beginning of miracles. You remember Moses? He began work in Egypt with a miracle of judgment, followed by plagues. He cast down a rod and it became a serpent. He turned water into blood. Jesus overcame the serpent with the rod of scripture and then turns water into wine. He doesn't bring plagues, he brings healings and gift upon gift, and favor upon favor. He actually came to bring joy and gladness as he begins his ministry with a blessing. The mission of Jesus is a happy one, so it opens at a wedding reception. You gotta love this guy, starting at a wedding reception. This story is in no other gospel. How did John know what to write? Well, John was there. He was one of the ones who was present. So this is a first-hand account. But I actually think that Mary told him her side of what went on. And the reason I think she told him and that he didn't hear that or observe it um, with his own ears is because I can't imagine Jesus reprimanding, chiding, or... Um, you know, responding to his mother the way he did for other people to hear. That was probably a private little conversation. Mom, my time has not yet come. So I believe that Mary told John what had happened. She probably told it to him after the crucifixion. 
And I'm also struck by the inconspicuous way that Jesus begins his ministry. Not by some great work before the Sanhedrin at Jerusalem. He doesn't go where people will stand up and notice. Small, little family gathering. Private event, a a marriage of poor peasants. The Bible doesn't even tell us their names. Unknown. Maybe you sometimes feel that there are the great, the movers and the shakers, but then there's you, then there's me. He notices you. He notices me. He noticed the little woman who put the might into the offering. He noticed children. He notices you. He notices me. He counts the hairs on our heads. And he will come to you It matters not who you are or what you do. It seems like Jesus loved to frequent the humble cottages. You find him more often with the poor, the fisher folk, the manual laborers, the farmers, the unknowns. He abides with the lowly, And he added to the joy of this wedding feast, a wedding feast in Galilee, no less. Jesus is interested in human happiness, and you don't miss out if you follow Jesus. I'm not talking about the prosperity gospel, though. I actually have sort of an aversion towards that kind of thing. You can fill a church with people if you promise them that God wants to make you ravingly, exceedingly wealthy and give you everything you could possibly imagine. That's not what I'm talking about. No. But Jesus is interested in human happiness. We don't seek him for things, but gifts flow from his love. So, my dad told a story in a sermon I remember hearing about when I was a teenager, and apparently I was one of the kind of teenagers Mark Twain wrote about, when Mark Twain said, when I was 14, I could not stand my father. I could not believe how foolish he was. But when I turned 21, I could not believe how much my father had learned in just seven years. So I was a teenager who preferred to be by myself or with my friends rather than with my parents. And I heard my dad, I have cassette sermons. Have you ever heard of cassettes? Yeah. I have some cassette sermons of my father preaching in 1973 at Southern Missionary College, it was called at the time. SMC. And he told this story. I listened to it just recently. And he said that... uh, he said, I want to tell you a little parable. And then he, and he said, I've got a teenage son. And he said, my son came to me the other day and he said, this is a parable. <laughs> my son came to me the other day and he said to me, Dad, I understand you're going to spend the day on a road trip. You have some places you need to go that are a little ways away. And I was just wondering if I could go with you. And as my dad's telling the parable, he says, and I said to myself, What? My son wants to go with me on a road trip? I said, are you kidding? He said, no, Dad, I'd just really love to go with you. Wow, I thought. Well, by all means, I said. We'll turn it into a wonderful, wonderful trip. Love to have your company. So the next day, we both got up. My wife packed a lunch. We got in the car, and we headed out on the road. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, I would never imagine me and my teenage son on the road because he wanted to be with me. What a day this is. And then my son said to me, Dad, you know, I could really use a Honda motorcycle. (laughs) And I said, excuse me? He said, yes, I could really use a Honda motorcycle. And I said, well, son, um, we don't have the resources to buy a motorcycle. I'm sorry. 
And he said to me, but I want one. And I said to him, I'm sorry. We can't afford it. And he turned and looked out the window on the side of the car for the rest of the trip. And it was a long trip. And when we finally got home that night, I went into the kitchen. My son went off to his room. My wife said, how was it? I said, it was miserable. He just wanted a motorcycle. I said, this is a parable. He said, this is a parable. So he says, now here we have to change the parable. My son says to me, Dad, I understand you're going to go on a trip. I say, yeah, I am. I'm going to be gone all day. He said, can I go with you? And I say, I'd love to have your company. So we get up. We put the lunch together. We get in the car. We head off down the road. We talk together. He asks me questions, like Alex Bryant. He asks me questions about things I'm interested in talking about. I take his lead. I ask him questions about things he enjoys talking about. And the miles fly by like nothing, and the hours go by like nothing. We enjoy our picnic lunch. We do the things that I had to do. The day is a joy. I get home at the end of the day. I tell my son, thank you for wanting to spend some time with the old man. He says, Dad, I'm just glad you let me come. Love you. I said, love you back. And he said, good night. And we'll have to do this again sometime. And I walked into the kitchen. And my wife said, how did it go? I said, my son likes me. I wonder if he could use a Honda. <laughs> Wasn't in my notes, but it seemed to work. We don't seek Jesus for things, but because of who he is, when we get to hang out with him, gifts come. He's interested in human happiness. When I first graduated from college, I was preparing to be a um, Seventh-day Adventist, secondary education, Bible teacher. And so I sent out resumes. I sent out 79 resumes to the Pacific Northwest. I wanted to live in the Pacific Northwest. You'd understand this more readily when you know that I was living in Southern California. I believe everybody in Southern California would like to live in the Pacific Northwest. They seem to be moving here. It, well, I only got one response from 79 resumes. And all it said was, thank you for sending us your resume. We have no openings at this time, but we'll put your resume in a file. Nobody else responded. And my first job was in southeastern California. After three years in the city, my wife and I were praying that we could raise our family, young family that was on its way, uh, in a more rural environment. And uh, we ended up moving to Colorado. So that was a nice thing. And we spent five years with our family, young family, there in a rural environment. Then we moved to Kansas. But I was still wanting to live in the Pacific Northwest. Colorado was good. It was an improvement over California. Amen. Amen. But it wasn't the Pacific Northwest. So we were praying while we were in Colorado. And we just sort of hinted to the Lord, the Pacific Northwest is still there. And we wouldn't mind being there too. Our next call went to Kansas City, Kansas, which isn't anything like the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> They told me when I arrived there that if you stand on a tuna can, you can see the entire state. <laughs> they, 
They told me if you stood on two cans, you could see the Colorado Rockies. And the president of Union College said the best thing to come out of Kansas or Nebraska is Interstate 70 or Interstate 80. <laughs> and if you're from Kansas, I'm sorry, I just... <laughs> Pastor Bing. <laughs> Anyway, after being in Kansas for three years, I didn't send out any more resumes. I just figured, you know, I'm just gonna go and be wherever he sends me, and I'm gonna quit agitating for some particular location. I'm gonna try and learn what Paul said he had learned, how to be satisfied and happy wherever he finds himself. And I guess God maybe was just waiting for me to get to that point because when I got there, he said, how would you like to move to the Pacific Northwest? <laughs> and we came and lived at Auburn, just a few feet from where I am right now and had some of the best nine years of our lives right here. Jesus just threw in the gift just threw in the blessing. And we were grateful. Well, back to John chapter 2. Jesus had been gone from Mary, who no longer had the companionship of Joseph. Mary has heard about the dove that settled down upon Jesus at the Jordan. Stories have come filtering back to her. Mary has heard the things that John was reported to have said, behold the lamb. Uh, she has heard about the voice that thundered when he came out of the water. She has heard about the wilderness and how he went out and disappeared for 40 days. She's heard these things, and if you do a little extra research uh, in the book Desire of Ages, you discover that John came and found her and told her about these things. Now she's helping with the wedding reception for some relatives, some family. They've asked her to be the wedding reception hostess, and so she's there. And Jesus and his disciples, his early disciples, they come. They've actually been invited. Oh, at least Jesus has been invited. But now he comes and he brings a few more mouths. And Mary is so excited to see him. She hasn't seen him since he left for the Jordan. He looks different now. He's lost a bunch of weight. And there's a half a dozen young men that seem to follow him wherever he goes and just hang on his words. And Mary is thinking to herself, I wonder... She's full of wonder and hope. Could it be? She knows he's a very special child. She knows that better than anybody on the planet. Well, you know the story. They run out of wine and she tells Jesus about the need. Woman, he says, my hour is not yet come. My glory and my kingship because that's what she was thinking, is not yet. But her faith outlived his gentle rebuke. And I wonder, can my faith outlive his apparent refusals? Hers did. And even though she was mistaken about what was to happen with him in the months ahead, even though she was mistaken, she persevered trustingly. And she turned to the servants who were helping her and she said, whatever he says, do.
In John chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, six stone water pots were standing there. They were used for Jewish ceremonial purposes and held 20 to 30 gallons each. Jesus told the servants, fill the jars with water. When the jars had been filled to the brim, he said, dip some out and take it to the master of ceremonies. So they followed his instructions. Did you notice how quiet and discreet, kind of under the radar, the miracle is? He didn't even call the master of the feast or the groom. Didn't, didn't alert anybody to what's going on. Jesus didn't ask the guests if they could all give their attention to him for a few moments. He'd like to direct their attention to something he's about to do. Please take note. Notice here I have six jars. Notice that they're empty. Observe carefully. As I... No, he didn't do that. He did his work quietly and without drawing any attention to it. He tells the servants to fill the water pots and then he works the miracle. Tells them to fill the water pots and then he works the miracle. What if the servants, what if the servants had objected? What if they had said, hey look, no offense, but we don't need more water. We need more wine. I know they both start with the letter W. Of course, that's not true in, but for us here. But we need water. What if they'd said that? They might have said, um, could we maybe just suggest that we might go to the market? Uh, maybe we could press a few grapes. Uh, maybe we could take up a collection. Maybe we could ask some neighbors if they have a little extra they could share, at least temporarily. Uh, to stop and fetch such quantities of water just doesn't make sense right now, Jesus. Bad timing. What if they'd said that? Well, if they'd said that, they never would have witnessed a miracle. Mary had said, whatever he says, do. And they witnessed a miracle. You know, if they had not had a need, they would never have experienced the miracle. And Mother Teresa once said a beautiful thing. She said, you will never know that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. One of my favorite non-biblical characters is George Mueller, a man of faith and prayer who took care of thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of orphans in Bristol, England. And George Mueller kept a journal, prayer journal, for, six, for 60 years. And when he died, his friends and loved ones went through his 60 years worth of prayer journals and they made note of more than 50,000 specific answers to prayer that George Mueller had recorded. It's a fascinating book, George Mueller's uh, autobiography. I, I carry that one with me in my phone and reread it over and over. It's, it's a wonderful book about prayer and faith. But George Mueller said something. I certainly don't qualify for this, but I'm inspired by it. He said, because they perpetually, over the 60 year span, they were perpetually on the brink of disaster. They were always short on food, always short on provisions, always, but even though they were always on the edge of God kept them. You remember the, the little widow woman that took care with the flour and the oil, remember? Just enough for one more meal. Always just enough for one more meal. Never excess, just enough. And so that's the way it was George Mueller. And over the course of those 50 years, he watched God come through, come through, come through, come through. He said never in all of the 60 years 
that I have been involved in this ministry, have I ever once seen God, see, never once, never once have I ever seen God not care for the need in time. He didn't, you know, he didn't say early. He said in time. Well, all that to say that George Mueller, he wrote this one time. He said, I keep, I, he said, I have a secret satisfaction regarding the size of the problem. I take a secret satisfaction. Now the reason it was a secret satisfaction is because if the rest of his helpers realized that he was really loving this, they would say, what is wrong with you? But he said, I take a secret satisfaction in the immensity of the problem because I know immense problems bring immense solutions from a God who knows how to part the Red Sea. So he said, the bigger the problem, the more I'm going secretly, yes! Oh, this is going to be good. We need more than we could ever come up with. What is he going to do now? Yes! Secret satisfaction. I wish I could tell you that every time a challenge comes my way, I do that. Yes! But I haven't reached that stage. Not yet. Anyway, they run out. They have a need. Nobody had foreseen that the wine would fail. Jesus had not come to the marriage prepared with quantities of extra wine. I'm bringing some of my friends along. We'll stop by the 7-Eleven and bring a little extra liquid, little refreshment, so, you know, make it go a little farther. No. The demand came all of a sudden and the supply came very quickly. The demand was all of a sudden and the supply was all of a sudden. Boom, boom. Jesus is always ready for every emergency. Something may happen tomorrow that you have not thought of, but it doesn't catch Jesus off guard. When the pandemic broke out in our world, and in less than two weeks the entire planet was grinded to a halt, up in heaven they didn't say, oh, what are we going to do now? Who would have ever thought we'd be dealing with something like this? No, didn't catch them off guard. And whatever's coming next isn't going to catch them off guard either. Buddy told me that when he reads through the Bible, there's two points that seem to come out of Scripture more regularly to him than any other. The first point is God saying to us over and over, I love you so much. And the second point, he said, that jumps out at him over and over in Scripture is God saying, I've got this. I love you so much, and I've got this. God's always ready for every emergency. Jesus will be ready for anything unexpected in your life. He'll be ready. And every one of us will meet with unexpected trials, but they will not surprise him. He will, not, he will always have enough to handle whatever comes your way. So he says, draw it out now. And as they took the water out of the stone jars, he said, draw it out and take it over to the ruler over there. And as it says, as they did so, the water turned to wine. There was no heavy effort. There was no heavy breathing. There were no worries, no challenges, no problems. It was as natural as falling out of bed, we might say, for Jesus. All right, fill the things with water. Okay, now draw it out take it over there. Boom. Natural. Just, boom. Jesus does the hard things with his left hand. No problem for him. He stands outside of Lazarus' tomb and he speaks. All he says is Lazarus' name. And it resurrects the dead. He does the hard things easily. 
Well, verses 9 to 11 say, When the master of ceremonies tasted the water that was now wine, not knowing where it came from, though of course the servants knew, he called the bridegroom over. Usually a host serves the best wine first, he said. Then when everyone is full and doesn't care, he brings out the less expensive wines. But you have kept the best until now. And so there's one final lesson that I want us to understand and to kind of contemplate here in this miracle. And it's how that this miracle contrasts the world's gifts with Jesus' gifts. You've saved the best till now. The master of ceremony says to the groom, most bring out the good stuff first, but you've saved the best for last. The things of earth grow strangely dim. The world's pleasures and treasures don't satisfy very long. I remember reading years ago, one of the first billionaires, back when a billionaire was somebody, um, Andrew Carnegie, he was asked, how much is enough? How much money is enough? He said, one dollar more than I have, which is another way of saying, never enough. The world's pleasures and treasures do not satisfy for long. A few years ago, my mother passed away. My father had passed earlier. My mother passed away. And uh, I have a learning disabled sister. She's just a couple of years younger than me, but she loves to go on roller coaster rides and um, um, things like that. And we thought as a way of maybe trying to be there for her and get her mind onto something, we would take her to Disney World. So we arranged to go to Disney World. And as we came through the entrance from the parking lot, we had to go under an arch, and across the arch said these words, the happiest place on the planet. What a wonderful thing that we could be at the happiest place on earth, right there. The happiest place on earth. I wish you could have seen the faces of the people in the happiest place on earth. As they stood in line for three hours to go on a ride that's over in two and a half minutes. They pay 200 plus dollars depending on the package deal they get for one day's ticket. And they're watching their clocks and they're counting it up in their head and they're saying, you know, the day is more than half over. We've only been on three rides. If we're lucky, we're going to get six. Divide that into 200. Do you realize how much each ride is costing us? And they're only two and a half minutes. This is the happiest place on earth. When I was first a, 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 a Bible teacher, I, I, my first three years of teaching was in southeastern California. I taught at a, a day academy called Orangewood Academy. From our ball field, you could see the Matterhorn of Disneyland. That's how close we were to Disneyland. And one, one semester, the administration and the registrar decided as a way of trying to improve attendance on our campus because of having kind of way too many tardies and absences. As a way of improving attendance, they said, if you get X number of, you know, level of, of, of good attendance, at the end of the semester, we'll give you the day off of school and we will pay for you to have the day at Disneyland. That was the worst attendance of the entire year. The kids were saying, Oh, please don't make us go to Disneyland. <laughs> they would have had more success if they had said, you're going to Disneyland unless you have good attendance. <laughs> My point is the things of earth grow strangely dim. The pleasures and treasures of earth do not last.
Desire of Ages, page 148, says, But the gifts of Jesus are ever fresh and new. The feast that he provides for the soul never fails to give satisfaction and joy. Each new gift increases the capacity of the receiver to appreciate and enjoy the blessings of the Lord. If you abide in him, the fact that you receive a rich gift today ensures the reception of an even richer gift tomorrow. He saves the best for last. It just keeps getting better with Jesus. He said to Nathaniel, remember? As Nathaniel approached, he said, Behold an Israelite, you know, an honest man. Nathaniel says, How did you know me? And he says, Man, I saw you when you were under the fig tree praying, you know. And Nathaniel says, Oh my, you are the Son of God. You are, you are the Messiah. Uh, and he, he bows down to worship him. And Jesus says to him, Oh, you believe because I told you I knew where you were hanging out? Good night, Nathaniel, he says. You're going to see greater things than these. Seems like I've heard that was a slogan somewhere. You're going to see greater things than these. That's another way for Jesus to have said, you ain't seen nothing yet. You're going to see greater things than these. The best is yet to come. When we lived here, we just lived right over here. I, I don't, I'm sorry, I can't remember the address, but faculty row, whatever, around the corner there. And um, Ron and Jeannie Miller lived down at the end of the street, and they had an Arabian horse. And our daughter, Lindsay, loved horses. She loved horses ever since she was a baby. When she was just a baby, we bought her these little, I think they were called My Little Ponies, when she was just a little, little, little girl. And they had different colors of hair and they had long manes and long tails and purple hair and green hair and blue hair and white hair and red hair. And, and, um, and where you always knew where Lindsay had been playing last because the ponies were always lined up in a row. Just. I once went to her home. She had just moved to it. And um, she had gone to bed and I went to get a drink of water in her um, kitchen. I opened up the, the cupboard above the sink thinking I'd find a cup there. And every single one of the cups in that shelf were standing at parade rest. And they were perfectly positioned. And I started to reach for one and the cups said to me, don't even think of taking one of us out of formation. Use your hands. So she had all these ponies lined up. And then as she got older, they went to briar horses. And those of you that like horses and know what I'm talking about, they're the more sophisticated version of the little ponies. And her love for horses just kept growing deeper and stronger and and then they started taking piano lessons from Jeannie Miller down at the end of the street. And they had an Arabian horse named Sahib. And they said, Lindsay, we know that you love horses. And if you'd like to ride Sahib anytime you want, you could treat him as though he was your horse. If you will just be the one responsible for feeding him and watering him, we'll let you ride him anytime you want and we'll supply the gear for it. And Lindsay thought that was a pretty sweet deal. Well, right next door to that pasture where Sahib was, there was a single woman who had five, I believe, mares. And um, one of them had, I th I, I th is, a, is a female baby colt called a filly. Had a little baby female Arabian horse. And this particular little baby uh, filly her father was a national champion and then he had had an unexpected demise. He had ended and his bloodline was highly prized and she happened to have the only, the only, um, what do you call it? He'd sired, he'd sired this filly and, he, and that was the only, you know what I mean. <laughs> she was his only child. All right. Yeah. 
And he was a national champion. And he, this little horse was worth a lot. And the horse was just so beautiful. And she was born on St. Patrick's Day. And so her owner had named her Irish. And Lindsay would go down to feed Sahib. And then she would stand and she would reach through the fence and pet Irish day after day after day. And this fondness for Irish is... She'd feed her handfuls of grass and even sneak some of Sahib's food over to her. And, and then all on her own, quietly, without telling anybody, Lindsay hatched a plan. For some years she had said, I don't want any presents for my birthday. I just want money. Just give me money. Um, and if there's any jobs I can do that I can make money, I just want money. And she saved. She's like nine years old at the time. And she's saving every penny, every dollar. Christmas, no presents, just money. Everybody be known, just money. Well, it didn't come in very fast or furious. But by the time she was 11 years old, she had $300 set aside. And she told her grandparents about this dream. And they said, well, how much have you got saved? She said, $300. And they said, Really? You're 11 years old and you've saved $300? Yeah. We'll match that. It's kind of like your evangelism opportunity. <laughs> we'll match that. So 11-year-old Lindsay wrote a letter. Her letter said, I know that Irish is worth a lot of money and I know that she is probably destined to be a show horse and travel at least North America. I know I could never afford her, but I know I love her. I don't have much money. I have $600 I could give you. But if you would sell Irish to me, I can promise you that she would be loved. And she wrote this little letter. She never told us. She just wrote this little 11-year-old girl, wrote this little letter and then she went down to the home where this woman lived and she stuck it between the screen door and the door at the front of the house, hoping that, you know, she'd hear back. And for the next several weeks, Lindsay would be the first to go to our mailbox to check the mail. And we wondered why she had this sudden interest in checking the mail. We didn't know nothing about this thing. And, and then one day, Lindsay comes in, 11-year-old Lindsay comes in with an envelope. Dear Lindsay, she opens it up. And then she starts to squeal with delight. And then she has us read the letter and it said to her, Dear Lindsay, you're right about Irish. She's worth a lot and she had a future in showing. But I think she would rather be loved than be shown. So what I'm saying to you, little girl, is you have just bought yourself a horse for $600. And those were precious years. But she had waited, and she had waited, and she had waited, and she had waited, and the years had gone by. And one day, finally, surprise, kind of like the best for last showed up, a champion horse for $600. That's the way Jesus is with us. He says, the best is yet to come. If you will wait on me, I won't disappoint you. If you will trust me, I won't disappoint you. You know, the Old Testament and the New Testament contains a lot of metaphors that involve marriage representing the tender and sacred union that's between Christ and his people. And you can be sure that Jesus, who was single and never married, was thinking ahead. He kept referring to a marriage supper and a wedding and a bride, and a reception. Single Jesus kept doing that.
And the wedding festivities pointed forward. I'm sure he was thinking about them right there as he provided wine for the guests. That wedding pointed forward to one yet to come when he brings his bride home. His bride. And the redeemed with the Redeemer sit down at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Isaiah 62 verse 5 says, As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. Zephaniah 3.17 says, He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. At a wedding, Jesus began his ministry. And at a marriage feast to which you are invited, it will all end. Or shall I say, all begin. It started at a wedding feast, it ends at a wedding feast. The Bible ends like a well-told tale. They were married and lived happily ever after. Jesus plans to celebrate a wedding between himself and his church, and you know who his church is. It is not a building. It is not a denomination. It is not an administrative structure or facility. It is you. You are his church. You are his bride. And he plans to celebrate a wedding between himself and you. And all the wine we will drink at that high festival will be of his own making. In fact, we're told that he's going to be serving at the reception. Picture Jesus coming down the line. Picture the wedding table, the, the, the reception table at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Picture it. Uh, your mind can't conceive of how glorious it's going to be. And there you are at the table. And maybe it's set outdoors alongside the shore of the sea of glass that looks like it's been mingled with fire. And maybe the china and the crystal is reflecting the colors that are rainbow colors over the city that's just off to the one side. And, 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 and just think about the glory and the beauty of it all. And, and the table's set and this fine linen. And, and there you are at this wedding feast, this reception. And guess who's serving? It's the groom. And he's coming along behind the guests who are at table. And he has a pitcher of wine, a pitcher of grape juice. And he looks over your shoulder and he says, oh, looks like you could use a little more. Let me just top that up for you. Yeah, what do you think? A little bit more? There you go. You know, I made it myself. Made the grapes too. <laughs> and what about the father? You know what he's going to be doing? He's going to be coming along right behind Jesus. And he's going to have a long linen cloth hanging over his hand, his arm. And he's going to look over your shoulder and he's going to see that tear of joy. And he's going to say, hey, hey, here, let me wipe away that tear. They're going to serve. And you're going to be there. Greater things. You haven't seen anything yet. And all the joy and all the bliss will be of his own giving. You know, at the close of John's life, the one who wrote this story, um, we have another letter that he wrote. It's called the book of Revelation. And in Revelation 19, verses 7 and 9, it says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding banquet of the Lamb. He saves the best for last, and you will never be disappointed while waiting on him. Ephesians 3.20 says, God is able to do far more than we could ever dare to ask or even dream of. Infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, or hopes. I'll never forget the first time I heard a pastor unpack Ephesians 3.20. He was using the King James Version as he unpacked it, and he did something like this. He says, have you ever noticed what it says here? It says, he is able to do exceeding, abundantly, 
above all that you could ask or think. He said, now let's just un let's unpack that a little bit. He said, exceeding. That's, that's a pretty cool thing. He's going to give you exceeding. This is more than you. Exceeding what? Exceeding, exceedingly abundantly. Wow. Abundantly. Exceedingly abundantly. Now that's kind of like a double positive. Oh, he doesn't stop there. Exceedingly abundantly above. Woo, above. Above what? Above all. Above all. Yeah, above all. Well, what's all? It's even more than all that you could ask. Oh, that is huge. Oh, no, no. More than that. All you could even think. Exceeding abundantly above all you could ask or think. He saves the best for last. He saves the best for last. Are you making him first? Set the alarm for when. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, $25. Sorry, I don't understand. <laughs> it wasn't me, it was Sari. She's going to give a bundle, I can tell you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. If you make him first, he'll see to it that you will taste the best, which will be the last, at the greatest family reunion ever attended. There will come a day when we see Jesus And know the troubles of this world are through When in the east we see our Savior coming As He promised, making all things new First we'll hear the angels' trumpet blowing brighter as the cloud draws near and then we'll hear sweet Jesus say I love you and I'm so glad that all of you are here please sing with me at God's family reunion Jesus Christ our brothers at the throne on earth, no separation, and someone who you love so much is gone, leaving you with teary eyes and memories, longing for that promised golden dawn, when God will finally raise his sleeping children. Tears of joy will flood the streets of heaven. Brother, I can't wait to see you there. Here we go, together. At God's family reunion, Jesus Christ, our brothers at the throne, family reunion, God has come to take his children. sorrow, no more pain ever with a Savior to remain no more heartache, no more grief only joy beyond belief together here we go at God's family union Jesus Christ our brothers family reunion God has come to take his children home 